Hi guys and welcome back. Uh, I'm Ted, the host of your lecture series. Um, for today's lecture, we'll be wrapping up our lecture on the Mexican War. And before we begin to uh, delve into the second half of that lecture, I'd just like to do a quick recap of the first half of our lecture on the Mexican War. Uh, so in the last lecture, we discussed the presidency, the early presidency of J.K. Polk. We discussed how Polk rose uh, from a from being a simple mem uh, simply a member of Andrew Jackson's inner circle to being uh, Andrew Jackson's point man uh, for the bank war in the House of Representatives. Uh, how after the Jacksonian uh, after Jackson's retirement, he became the governor of Tennessee. He lost two elections, two consecutive attempts to uh, regain that the office of governor of Tennessee, and he subsequently. Uh, benefited from his loss of office uh, because he became the uh, the principal choice for the Democratic Party to be their nominee for the 1844 presidential election and that he actually won a stunning victory it wasn't a major victory but it was stunning in that he defeated a man with over 35 years of political experience at the national level Henry Clay uh, defeated him and uh, won and, uh, and assumed the office of president uh, once, in, once in power, he oversaw the annexation of Texas and the admission of Texas and Florida uh, to, to our slave states into the Union in 1845. Um, and while as president, he moved to uh, resolve the Western boundary disputes. He wanted to edge the British out of the Oregon Territory and extend uh, America as far as he could in the West. And he also wanted to uh, edge the Mexicans out of as much territory as he could uh, in the Southwest, um, sending uh, General Zachary Taylor uh, to secure the western boundary of Texas. And Taylor at first uh, proceeded cautiously, but after receiving instruction from Washington, he moved further into the, the, the disputed area, the land between the, the New Estrus River and the Rio Grande River. Uh, we also discussed how Taylor scored a critical victory at Palo Alto, um, defeating the uh, defeating the Mexican army and really just uh, really just taking command of that territory uh, and really putting uh, putting the United States and the United States Army on the uh, sort of we uh, really just sort of giving them the edge in the early stages in the early dispute with Mexico. Um, and from there we'll pick up and uh, we'll begin by discussing the United States Army and, Une and the Mexican Army on the eve of the, of the war between the two countries. Now the United States Army in 1846 was only 6,500 men strong. Uh, it was comprised of the United States Army of uh, 1846 was comprised of 16 regiments um, and the army training and doctrine was largely unchanged from the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Some units were even equipped with outdated muskets. Now, the Army's regiments were still organized along 18th century British lines, with a regiment having 10 companies, and two of those companies being uh, light infantry, skirmishers, uh, and grenadiers, who served as uh, sort of who sort of flankers. You know, they, well, they would always position them on the flanks. Um, half of the army was comprised of immigrants, and the majority of the senior officers had been commissioned before the War of 1812. Some of the officers had even had, uh, had actually never maneuvered a body of troops that was larger than a few companies. Polk, however, was undaunted by the task, and uh, to add more muscle to the army, uh, he decided to um, to uh, ask. Uh, the states for 50,000 men. Um, he accepted regiments of state volunteers uh, who will be issued uniforms and equipment by their respective states and only issued weapons by the federal government. Now this plan created a very unsightly fighting force for the United States. Um, there would be the disciplined regular army regiments or the reasonably disciplined regular army regiments under professional officers who were easily identifiable in their dark blue jackets, light blue trousers. Um, uh, basically the same uniform that the United States would use in the uh, Civil War and basically the same dress uniform that the United States Army uses now. Um, dark, dark blue, almost navy blue uh, jacket and sort of sky blue robin's egg blue trousers. 
Um, and then, uh, and that will be contracted by the state volunteers, who would be uh, who will be led by would be politicians, and will be clad in anything that they can muster that they can find. Uh, there are reports, uh, writings of state volunteers who are still wearing tree corner hats. Um, you know, a, a relic of let's say the uh, the war of uh, 1812, or more accurately. Um, a remnant of uh you know late 1790s 1780s warfare or popular fashion um now the mexican army by contrast was four times as large as the united states army uh the mexican army had been in and out of combat at regular intervals in the 19th century they were battle hardened they were battle tested uh they had after all won their own bloody war of independence against spain um, and Spain uh, and the Mexican army did not have France or Great Britain or any other of the European powers to really come and back them up. They had to win this war on their own. Um, and after the war, there was a lot of infighting between different factions of Mexico for control of, uh, of the nation. Um, the Mexican army had seen uh, conflicts rage uh, from the Isthmus of Panama all the way to uh, the, the far extremes of the old vice royalty of New Spain. Um, in and out of combat, uh, really battle hardened, uh, but this was only a surface professionalism. Um, and it concealed the reality that Mexico really didn't have uh, weapon producing factories. They imported all of their weapons. Um, they had few facilities capable of closing her troops. They're, uh, they, they weren't that industrialized. I would say that Virginia and North Carolina in the 1840s uh, pro um, were slightly edged out by Mexico's national uh, industrial capabilities. Uh, um, and mostly all of her troops were conscripted. Uh, that is, they were drafted. Um, they would simply go in and draft peasant boys uh, and bring them in for military service. And whenever the peasant boys were needed, they were simply turned out and sent back home. Um, the officers were were uh, were from the the elites, for, from the wealthy families. And the officers actually had a. Uh, good training there there is uh there was back then and it still exists a national service academy for training the uh the future leaders of the mexican national army uh however most of the appointments for senior generalships and most of the appointment for command were not issued um based off of your ability to lead or command most most most, most of those positions were issued off of your political connections and your family connections uh which which wasn't really out of time for the for the time or the place it wasn't uh something that was unique to mexico it happened in the united states it happened uh in the united states at the time it happened uh in great britain at the time uh but they but they really weren't that uh that well led there were a lot of people who did not really have the experience or the mindset to really command troops and command the mexican army uh but with that all being said, the Mexican army, uh, Mexican army was still a formidable foe. Um, they looked uh, like the odds favorite. Uh, they were poorly fed, poorly clothed, and paid, uh, poorly paid. But the Mexican army uh, was tenacious in nature, and they did not lack for bravery. Um, and that's where we begin things picking up, picking things up again with Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor was the uh, with the senior general, the, the senior army officer on command, uh, on, on, in place really, um, uh, within the during the opening stages of the Mexican American War, Taylor had been given command of one of four principal field armies of the United States. Uh, one of four principal field armies that the United States would use during the uh, Mexican War. Um, Taylor uh, aimed to capture the arid re northern regions of Mexico. He made Monterey, the capital of Nuevo Leon, his primary objective. By September uh, 19th, 1846, Taylor was zeroing in on Monterey. 
And for two days, his infantry battled away, smashing through street barricades and his artillery fire round after round onto the city's innermost defenses. Uh, the Mexican garrison the, uh, eventually surrendered and evacuated Monterey, but Taylor's army was so exhausted by their assault on the on the fortified city that they could not really just, you know, uh, dictate any terms to the Mexican army, to the Mexican defenders, who were allowed to keep their possessions, namely their weapons, had they evacuated the city. Uh, but nonetheless, Taylor's capture of Monterey proved to be the first great victory of the war as it was declared. Uh, Palo Alto was great, but, but the capture of Monterey really galvanized the uh, the war effort it really uh helped to disquiet uh to just quiet some of Polk's uh opponents back at back at back in Washington and in the uh, United States as a whole. Uh this uh victory also was the first victory of the United States Army on foreign soil. Um it was the uh, the first time that the United States Army went into a foreign nation and captured uh, a major, uh, a major settlement, a major possession of of their belligerent, of their uh, the other force. Now, the loss of Monterey sent Mexico City into a flurry of activity, and Santa Ana, with some assistance from the United States Navy, was able to slip back into Mexico. Uh, and once back in Mexico, Santa Ana dropped all attempts at aiding peace negotiations and offered his services to the Mexican government. Santa Ana at this time uh, was still a very popular figure. Um, he, he was given command of the Mexican army. Santa Ana was an accomplished military commander. Uh, he had uh, he had won a lot of victories and a lot of wars for the Mexican army. He was um, uh, a highly decorated officer in the Mexican army before his uh, exile. Um, Santa Ana uh, was quickly given command of the uh, the Mexican army and charged with organizing a defense uh, for the remaining Mexican territory and then also capturing and driving out the American invaders. Um, but Santa Ana was still unpopular in certain segments. Some people remembered his, uh, his, personal, his personal rule, um, his establishment of a Napoleonic-like uh, dictatorship. Um, and his opponents... Uh, his opponents uh, criticized him um, and the stand that the uh, Mexican army had made at Monterey. Uh, Santa Ana had been given command of the Mexican army shortly uh, before um, the capitulation of the forces at Monter uh, Monterey. And he had organized uh, efforts to relieve the garrison of Monterey, but it was fatally delayed by antagonistic opponents of his. His opponents uh, lobbed accusations that Santa Ana was only looking for an opportunity to install himself a president again and Santa Ana it, we really don't know probably the answer is most likely uh, he had he had an inclination he had future designs on being president of Mexico again but for the time being Santa Ana had his hands full with the uh, various American forces being organized and diving into North Mexico uh, he did not have enough men on hand to uh, to meet that threat uh, and he did. Be, he did very seriously begin a reorganization of the uh, United States um, of Mexico Army, of the uh, United Mexican States Army, um, using a lot of questionable uh, and upright means. He openly recruited uh, his fellow Mexicans uh, by, by painting the war in patriotic terms, and he also seized other people's property to pay for enlistment bounties. Uh, but Santa Ana. Uh, raised a fighting force of 21,000 men to defend northern Mexico and recapture uh, Monterey. And in ju uh, January of 1847, he moved north to confront Zachary Taylor. Uh, and he found Taylor at Buena Vista. And at this point, Taylor is still the principal uh, officer, the principal officer of the United States Army in, uh, in the Mexican War. He had already won a Palo Alto. He captured Monterey. And now it's Taylor and his force against uh, Santa Ana and his forces at Buena Vista. And the Battle of Buena uh, they met up at Buena Vista on the 22nd of February, 1847. Uh, the clash between the two armies uh, should have been an easy victory for Santa Ana. Uh, Taylor only had 4,800 uh, men, and Santa Ana brought that entire 21,000-man force with them. Um, 
but wave after wave of Mexican attacks were broken by Taylor's artillery. Um, artillery really, really uh, emerges as the uh, the primary weapon of Zachary Taylor, um, which is really interesting because Santa Ana had the Napoleon complex, uh, but he but he didn't really use artillery effectively. And Taylor, uh, as far as I know, never really had Napoleon. Uh, was never really an aficionado for Napoleon Bonaparte, but he uses artillery well, um, similarly similarly to the Corsican. Um, Santa Ana was defeated at Buena Vista. He was uh, eventually compelled to call for his army's retreat. Now, while uh, while Santa Ana was gathering his forces and while Taylor was securing these early victories, Polk wasn't really idle. Polk really was an annexationist. Um, he was a very active president, and, uh, and he really wanted to prosecute this war to the fullest. Uh, he had ordered Colonel Stephen Kearney to uh, march from Fort Leavenworth in the Kansas, and it really, uh, it's in Kansas now, but it was really yet the unorganized portions of the uh, western, um, of uh, the Midwestern Louisiana Purchase country. Uh, he ordered Colonel uh, Kearney into the province of New Mexico uh, with the goal of capturing Santa Fe, uh, which, which Kearney did. Uh, and after the capture of Santa Fe, Kearney took 300 uh, of his dragoons, that is, mounted cavalry. Uh, mounted cavalry men with uh, sabers and pistols. Uh, further west, to rendezvous with Admiral Stockton at San Diego on the Pacific Coast. Um, this is a joint, uh, what, we, what we would call a joint branch operation, in which you had the American Navy and the American Army joining forces to accomplish a, a, a Pacific goal. The goal was to uh, capture the, the port city of uh, San Diego on the Pacific coast, uh, sort of providing a beeline, um, moving from uh, the Rio Grande into Santa Fe and then onto the Pacific coast uh, to sort of uh, outline American claims after the war. Um, and the, the rendezvous was successful. Uh, American immigrants into California had initiated uh, had a, uh, initiated a rebellion in California in imitation of the Texas rebellion. Um, they staged an uprising against the Mexican government and they proclaimed California to be an independent republic. Um, and they, they 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 did so with a very unique flag, a bear fl uh, with a bear on it. That's where the uh, the bear flag comes from. That's why California flag has republic has republic on it. Um, it's literally the same flag, the, the bear flag. Um, uh, together, the combined American uh, forces overwhelmed the small garrison under the Mexican governor at the Battle of, of uh, San Gabriel River on January 8, 1847. And California soon fell under American occupation. Now, Kearney's forces that he left in New Mexico not wanting to be idle, went on their own adventure and they captured the city of El Paso on December 26, 1846. So again, we can already see the, the, the beeline for the, for the uh, post-war treaty, for the uh, post-war treaty that the United States would want to impose. Now, two weeks after Taylor's victory at Buena Vista, uh, Winfield Scott, a veteran of the War of 1812, landed at Veracruz with 14,000 troops by far the largest army given to an American uh, commander um, in, I think, about two generations, not since the other uh, War of 1812, um, had one American had command over such a large army. Um, the landing at Veracruz was deeply symbolic. Uh, Hernan Cortez had landed at Veracruz before conquering Mexico in 1859. And, uh, not 1859, uh, 1519, sorry about that. In 1519, that is where Hernan Cortez uh, landed before conquering uh, Mexico from the Triple Alliance. Um, this successful invasion was the first time that the United States Army and United States Navy worked together on a joint branch uh, operation and a joint operation into foreign territory. Um, the, he, uh, the, they, they linked together and they landed before uh, the, um, the rendezvous uh, at, San, uh, at San Diego. Um, to add uh, to this accomplishment, um, Scott's army 
actually disembarked under intense fire from the Mexican coastal artillery before eventually forcing the, the uh, defenders to, uh, to surrender under a hail of fire from their own artillery. Um, Scott then began a arduous in-country march to Mexico City, again emulating Hernan Cortez by using the exact same road the conquistador had used and continuing to add an element of psychological terror to his opponents. Um, for many, it was 15, uh, 15, 19 all over again and Cortez was coming uh, and, and Scott was coming to do exactly what Cortez had done. Um, Santa Ana hurriedly moved his army south after his defeat at Buena Vista. He could have opposed Taylor again and Taylor forces were uh, exhausted but he could not uh, simply battle away to protect the north when the capital was in danger and it was it was no doubt there was no doubt where Scott was taking the 14,000 American troops. He was heading straight for um, the, uh, the Mexican uh, capital. He was heading straight to uh, Mexico City. Um, so Santa Ana hurriedly moved to put his forces uh, in his plaque to block him. Um, at Cerro Gordo, they, they met, they clashed, and Santa Ana vainly tried to block Scott's uh, advancement, but was outflanked and then overrun by Scott's army. Uh, in fact, Santa Ana was nearly killed by a brigade of Illinois uh, state volunteers. Uh, Scott then moved on and defeated yet another attempt by the Mexican army to block his advancement at Contreras and by August he was approaching Mexico City. Uh, the Mexicans had fought with mounting fury and desperation and now with their back against the wall they would literally redouble that, uh, that effort. In a series of hammer-like assaults on the outer rings of Mexico City's defenses, uh, the, the convent of Churubusco, um, the foundry at Molina del Rey, and the, the castle of uh, Chapultepec, the, uh, the fortifications uh, at Chapultepec, um, which was defended by the Mexican Military Academy's cadets. Uh, remember I said that Mexico had a professional academy to train its military leaders? Uh, the cadets there, uh, who are remembered as Los Niños Heroes, uh, the boy heroes, um, they they left the academy. They, they left their schooling and they jumped into a uh, defend um, Chapultepec, uh, but but it was all in vain. Um, Scott was Winfield Scott was a very capable, perhaps the one of the most capable military commanders in the history of the United States, and he struck. He he, uh, he knew when to strike. He knew when to recoil. Um, he defeated them there, and he uh, he finally uh, attacked uh, the gate. Um, uh, San, San Cosme Gate um, successfully take uh, successfully defeating them there and successfully taking Mexico City uh, with the fall of the Mexican government all opposition to the United States receded uh, the Mexican war was a very small affair compared to the later and earlier wars of the 19th century when you take it with the uh, um, the uh, the Prussian Wars uh, that would be the series of wars that Prussia fought against her North German neighbors and then against uh, France, Denmark, and Austria-Hungary. You know these were very minor affairs. Likewise, the uh, Napoleonic Wars, very uh, very massive, very large affair, and of course the uh, the later colonial wars that the major European powers would engage in. Uh, it was a very minor affair. Uh, even when you compare it with the uh, the equally short uh, uh, Crimean War, it was a very minor affair. It did not have nearly the uh, the loss of life. Didn't have uh, nearly the uh, the major international political ramifications um, as the Crimean War or the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, it was uh, an important event for the United States uh, Army and the uh, Mexican Army. Um, the United States Army swelled uh, from roughly you know 16,000 men to over 100,000 men in some cases. Uh, and while they suffered casualties, it wasn't really catastrophic. It gave the rise to this belief that we can raise an enormous army and we can win a victory rather quick. Um, it fed into manifest destiny. Uh, there was also the recurrence of the old militia uh, regular discord, but for the most part, 
everybody had gotten along reasonably well. Uh, it seemed that war sort of dampened sectional tensions. Uh, that going out and beating up somebody else sort of ease your own internal problems. Uh, and, and, and chief, chief amongst the uh, outcomes for the United States was that the United States Army had performed uh, way better. They, they had performed more admirably than anybody thought that they would. It was, it was really just stunning that the United States Army was able to so swiftly defeat the Mexican Army. Um, the Mexican War also provided a practical training ground for many of the future officers that we will hear about later on. Uh, the war ended officially with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in February of 1848. Now, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, forced Mexico to cede two-fifths of her territory, which included all of the current states of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, uh, Utah, Colorado, and the Mexican... Uh, and also forced the Mexican government to agree to recognize the Rio Grande as the official border between Mexico and Texas. Uh, in 1853, the Mexicans were again actually prevailed upon to sell additional territory, uh, a strip of land along the Gila River, um, and the purchase. Uh, the, this transaction is normally known as the Gadsden's Purchase, uh, and to uh, and really just to make matters worse. Uh, the, for the Mexican government, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in California right before uh, peace was declared, right, right before everything was finalized. Um, so that really just deprived the Mexican government of, uh, of more resources. Uh, every, everybody can use more gold. Um, the end of the Mexican War uh, raised doubts about the morality of Manifest Destiny for the first time uh, amongst uh, the general uh, European-American um uh, amongst European Americans uh, in general. Uh, men like uh, Illinois Congressman Abraham Lincoln raised criticism that saw the war, uh, raised criticism, and he presented the view of the war as little more than a vehicle for the expansion of slavery. And with that being said, we'll break and we'll end our lecture on the Mexican War. Uh, I hope you guys found this enlightening, uh, entertaining, and of course informative. As always, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about the uh, Mexican War. And as always, I am Ted, and I'll see you guys next time for another lecture.